Welcome back to another episode of Give Me Some Truth International. Dame la verdad, as we've also said. Dis-moi la vérité. Uh, today we're going to be talking about a little bit uh, different topic uh, that we haven't touched on before. Usually we've been focusing on uh, American expats, Americans living outside of the, the United States and what they have to do with their investments and how to manage those. Also questions uh, around their lives and financial lives, dealing with taxes and so on and so forth. Today we're going to talk a little bit differently about uh, you know non-Americans investing in the United States. What uh, you know you might say uh, foreigners investing in the United States. Uh, you know we'll probably rely on our uh, former foreigner Sill, as you're now a United States citizen. Correct. You're you were at one point in this uh, situation yourself as a a non-American citizen. Uh, and Stan, you've dealt with this a little bit as well in your personal life, as your wife was not an American citizen. Right, right. And, and let's let's make it clear: it's not just not citizens, not resident as well, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that and that was what I was going to say: is there's also another category, a non-resident investing in the United States. Why they might do it, some of the pitfalls, some of the things to to be aware of uh, in handling these things. Um, so why might so the the case of you know still investing in the United States, living here even as a resident, non-citizen, you know, seems pretty pretty apparent. But why might a non-resident, non-citizen invest right. in the United States? Yeah, that's a great question. And there's, there's a few different reasons for it. Um, but if you think about, so again, the scenario is someone who lives outside the United States, is not a green card holder, not a citizen, but wants to invest in the United States, for example, open an account in the U.S. with a broker or bank and hold their investments in the U.S. Uh, The most obvious reasons, really, why people invest in different jurisdictions really have to do with the attractiveness of that jurisdiction as as an investment location, right? And I think the U.S. is right up there at the top as far as international jurisdictions. And you know, wealthy investors and and families look for things like jurisdictions that have a great history of uh, protecting property rights, for example. And I think if you think about, you know, the, the big uh, international centers um, like, you know, London or, uh, you know, Switzerland and, and, and New York, you know, the UK, Switzerland, uh, the US, uh, these are all countries that have a strong tradition of protecting property rights and we it's like we almost take take it for granted here um but you know if you think about people who live you know maybe outside the developed world for example um those things really matter to them they really mean something well and even in in france um you know uh one of the the interesting sort of family histories is is the history of the rothschild family in in france who owned a bank in in France, and when Mitterrand was elected in the 1980s, uh, you know the bank was seized by the state, and uh, you know, kind of fortunately yeah. there there were Rothschilds, so they held up okay. Um, but you know, a case where even in the in the quote unquote first world, pro- property uh, rights aren't necessarily absolutely. Respected. So property rights are a big thing, and then, then stability, right? Um, you know, again, uh, the U.S. is seen as a as a fairly stable uh, place where, you know, you can be confident that 50 years from now, um, you know, the, the, the situation w- will be, uh, you know, still pretty right. decent, right? And would be just a, a good environment to hold your investments. Our, 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 our regulatory environment is very stable. In fact, we're in the not too distant future coming up on 100 years of the two principal securities acts that uh, really established um, the the rules of fair play and anti-fraud rules governing um, the purchase and sale of securities yeah. and, and and those that manage and advise on securities the, yeah the 33 act and the 34 act as they're as they're called so we have a long tradition of transparency mm-hmm. and stability and I think the regulatory f- framework really, um, plays a large part of that. Absolutely, I think that's a that's an important factor, and uh, and it's part of the overall attractiveness of just U.S. capital markets in general, right? So there's a strong history of just regulation, and also it's cost efficient, right? I mean, uh, and we, it's like 
this is a place where, you know, you can open an account and access markets in a very safe and efficient way. Right. right. And that is uh, something that, again, for us, we take it for granted that you can open an account at a broker and, you know, not pay trade commissions and things like that. Yeah. Um, but that's not the case everywhere in the world. Uh, there are many countries around the world where, um, you know, they're just making basic investments and just deploying a very standard type of investment portfolio uh, is cumbersome and is expensive. Um, and they don't even have the same, you know, depth of regulation and investor protection and things like that. So in terms of value that you're getting for your money, the U.S. is really ahead of so many countries around right. the world. On yeah, advisory yeah. fees as well, well by the way. Yeah, I, I, might, I might selfishly point <laughs> out yeah. that very few places in the world where you know, a person can have their money managed with, you know, a couple of million dollars and, 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 and have it done by true professionals with lots of experience Absolutely. For, for less, for under 1%. A year. Absolutely. So if you look at that, if you look at just the history of uh, investor uh, protection, if you look at the regulation, the, the overall stability and just the efficiency of, um, you know, just accessing capital markets in the U.S., I think overall you've got a very attractive package, even yeah. for people who don't necessarily have ties to the U.S. Yeah, well, one final point on that efficiency is because, you know, the U.S. is the world's largest trading market, you don't see wide spreads mm -hmm. on securities. You know, if you're buying right. and selling something like, uh, 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 you know, a share in, in the S&P 500 General Electric or Coca-Cola or whatever, uh, you you won't see you know somebody bidding uh, offering to buy a stock at five dollars and somebody else offering to sell it at four dollars right They're, the spreads are usually a penny or less and so that helps the efficiency and makes life easier for Absolutely. investors as well so those are all you know I think on the efficiency front you know good, good sort point, of Keith. things that's yeah. one thing that like people don't think about at all right. And I also think, you know, even if you're trading in many cases, you can also access, you know, European markets mm -hmm. through the U.S. or smaller markets in a way that's even more efficient sometimes than yep. buying in those countries. You, you know, uh, ETFs that deal with specific countries and so on and so forth. So there are a lot of relative things to that mm -hmm. that I think help uh, the efficiency of U.S. capital Absolutely. markets. Mm -hmm. When it comes to cost, we haven't even touched on the – Larger costs of investing, which are taxes, right? Right. And so maybe we can talk about, you know, some of the pitfalls, some of the potential issues associated with foreigners investing in the U.S. So we talked about why they might want to do it, and it all makes sense. But it, it, it's not necessarily, you know, there are still, it's an opportunity, but there are, there's also potential issues right. that are associated with, with doing that. Um, so, I mean, first of all, in practice, it may be difficult uh, because maybe not every bank or every broker will be open to uh, working with foreign nationals. So you right. kind of need to know the landscape and understand what services are available to you. And, and um, one thing I'll, I'll note relative to that, um, one of the big things to be aware of if you're looking at investing in the United States, there, there are a series of laws and what often wrongly happens is clients think they're prohibited from opening accounts as, as non-U.S. citizen, non-U.S. residents because of FATCA in the U.S. But really what it is, is in most cases, most big banks, uh, not brokerages, however, the, mm -hmm. the, the law applies to banks, are subject to KYC regulations that the United States passed in the mm -hmm. wake of, of the September 11th, 2001 attacks. And so if your brokerage is owned by a bank, the, that brokerage will be subject to those rules in a way that an independent brokerage may not be, be subject to them. So that's one consideration. Those KYC requirements are also why for many uh, bigger brokerages, they may have requirements about your net worth. Uh, if you're yep. not a U.S. citizen, how many you have to come to the U.S. a certain number of times and meet in person those sorts of things, because they are, they really strongly regulate uh, foreign money laundering conditions, and so those are those are the rules that you have to worry about. Less so, FATCA, though FATCA can play into some of this. Sure, absolutely. I think a lot of oftentimes people have this idea that maybe something is illegal, or you know that there are specific rules that would prevent them from doing so. There's nothing illegal about 
a foreign national investing in the U.S., whether it's through a brokerage account or, or bank or in real estate or anything like that. But it's just that banks and brokers uh, have their own requirements and they can make risk-based decisions to not have to deal with the complexity of doing KYC, know your client on a foreign national, for example, and, and they have full flexibility and freedom to do so. Yeah, and so I think one of the differences is with many financial advisors, the KYC process is, or, or KYC, you know, your client is built into our process, right? Absolutely. You know, for us to manage money effectively, we feel we have to have your whole financial picture, do the f- financial planning, you know, all of those sorts of things. If it's a, you know, just a broker where you can make commissions or that mm-hmm. sort of thing, you know, that financial planning the other thing is, you know, much smaller firm versus much bigger firm. All of a sudden, you know, at a much bigger firm, you have to worry about 16,000 brokers and advisors versus, you know, the right. three of us in this room. And so, you know, it's much easier for someone to maybe get involved with something that's in the gray area. And that's why a bank or a, a larger firm might restrict it mm-hmm. as well. So, absolutely. you know, it's it's the advantage of kind of dealing with a boutique firm. Yeah, so absolutely. And so even assuming that you you got past those hurdles and you managed to open an account and, and set up, uh, uh, you know, have the, the infrastructure to start investing through a U.S. bank or broker, there are still potential issues, right? There are tax issues that you need to be aware of, right? So maybe we can touch on that a little bit. Sure. Uh, and I would say maybe they fall into two categories um transfer taxes and income taxes one would be yeah exactly so one would be income tax related and the other one would be maybe state tax related right right well let's do the let's like normally i would say let's do the income tax first but like i think it makes sense in this case Mm -hmm. because the biggest um precaution or thing that a a a a non-resident alien needs to be aware of when investing in the united states is the U.S. estate tax yeah, rules. That's right? really number because one. Because if you have your, if you're investing in a U.S. brokerage and you have U.S. stocks or U.S. ETFs, um, um, you have the potential to gain estate tax exposure and gift tax exposure very quickly. Mm-hmm. Okay, because and this is very different from a, a U.S. citizen or, or or permanent resident. Okay, somebody living here or Amer- an American abroad. This is a very different issue uh, because while the American um, domicile, uh, which would be a citizen no matter where you are, or a green card holder in the United States, has this very large lifetime exclusion from gift and estate tax of about $11.5 million, right? The, the exemption... And that's come up with inflation each and every year. I think it's now been like 30 years that the non-resident aliens estate tax exemption on their U.S. situs assets has remained fixed at $60,000. Okay. So that means that, say, hypothetically, you're a non-resident alien. You have uh, $100,000 worth of assets only. Like, you know, it doesn't have to be a large amount. You got $100,000 worth of U.S. ETFs in a U, in a U.S. They're U.S. registered ETFs, and you die and you want to leave them to your non resident alien children, right? Um, you're going to pay um, about 30% on, on uh, the 40000 that exceeds your exclusion amount. So there's going to be, a, you know, a relatively hefty tax bill for such a small account. Um, do and uh, let's say that you want to you've you've got this accounts and you want to gift them to your two children mm-hmm. same same result right um, so that's huge and right. that's a major risk so and it's avoidable though. it's completely avoidable right right but it, it, the worst case scenario here is you're a foreign national you open an account at a broker you invest in shares of Apple. Yes. So in principle, you're not because you're not a citizen, you're not a resident, you're not subject to U.S. estate tax, except if you own U.S. assets mm-hmm. and you've effectively put yourself in a situation where maybe you've invested a big chunk of your wealth in a U.S. asset. And when you die, you're subject to estate tax and you only have a $60,000 exemption and anything above that is taxed at 40%. So you can lose 
a huge chunk of your wealth um, just by not being careful, not being aware enough of that potential tax liability. I think also what you're identifying uh, speaks to another case where people may end up not realizing that they have U.S. investments is if you work for a U.S. company outside of the United States as a mm -hmm. non, non-citizen, non-resident, and you have stock options, and all of a sudden mm -hmm. you own, you know, Apple shares yeah. or City shares or whomever, all of a sudden, you know, that's a U.S. Citus asset. Absolutely. In cases. And so that is something that you may want to have to, you're going to have to think about and plan around. And yeah. so how is it, how is it avoidable, you know? Right. Well, I mean, it's it's avoidable, but here's, I mean, but there's an investment to be made up front in that too, right? Because it, it, it's most easily avoidable by um, creating, well, there's two ways it's avoidable. One's simple, one causes investment um, in creating uh, a, a separate entity, if you will, right? Because the entity lives on. And by entity, I mean something like, a, a trust or an or a an offshore um, entity mm -hmm. like a British Virgin Island um, company, company. Companies don't die. That's, companies that's, don't die. That's and, the and, and trusts are separate legal entities, right? So so um, the whole idea there is it, it, it needs to be if you own through the entity, then you own the entity, and you can pass ownership of that entity on to your children, right? Or if you set up a trust, the beneficiaries, the successor beneficiaries, successor trustees are going to be mm -hmm. those children, right? And those entities don't die. So the underlying companies um, continue to be owned by an entity, right? Right. So there's, so, so there, in, entities don't die. There's never an estate tax, right? Mm -hmm. And, and, and the, uh, the gifting can be of those non U.S interests in the trust or the entity right the easiest way um and i and, and i'm you know it, it's is is a geographically limited easy way right and that is simply that the u.s has um estate and gift tax treaties with uh, i think 17 18 different countries um in the world um these tend to be some of our uh, closest allies, but um, you know it's certainly not every country in Western Europe. It tends to be quite a few of them. Uh, when, and and we had a treaty with Canada, and the protocol with Canada still is in place. And these treaties, oftentimes, we find that the greatest benefits, the the one class of people that are most benefited from these mm -hmm. treaties, are foreigners that want to invest in the United States because it. These treaties either declare that your ownership of intangible personal property, which would include securities interests, mm -hmm. right, or uh, that that those are non-U.S. situs that 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 only your residence country can tax those um, upon death or or gift, um, or the treaties, and this is some of the older versions of the treaties, just simply grant the residents of the counterparty treaty country, a pro rata U.S. size deduction as if like, let's say, for example, if the U.S. lifetime exclusion or exemption is eleven and a half million dollars and you have half of your property or your net worth at the time of death, you know, your, your, your estate mm -hmm. is in the U.S., and half of it is elsewhere, your residence country or, or anywhere, really, um, then you're going to get a, what would that be, uh, five and yeah. three quarters million dollar exemption on your U.S. estate tax mm -hmm. or gift tax, right? So, so either way, the, treat, treat, the treaties are great where they apply, yeah, right? Because then you don't have to go through the rigmarole. Of right. setting up an entity, although you know people may be able to set up the entities with uh, you know actually you know very little expense. Yeah. In this world today, you know you can set sure. up companies in you know the Caymans or the British Virgin Islands right. or or whatever. Um, 
if you're richer, you might want to set up something more like a, a South Dakota trust, mm -hmm. right? Something like that. Okay. Yeah, and, so, and, and the the trust question is is an interesting one because trusts are not something that necessarily exists elsewhere in the world. But uh, for uh, non-Americans, uh, non-citizens, non-residents investing in the United States, they have lots of uses. Um, one of them that we might not touch on today, uh, just for, for time reasons, if you're buying U.S. real estate as a, as a foreign national non-resident, yeah. Uh, a trust almost becomes a requirement um, because of transfer taxes and so on. But these kind yeah. of structures, if you're looking to invest in the United States, sort of become a default in, yeah, in many uh, cases. Absolutely. And, and, and you're right that we, we haven't touched on real estate because that's kind of a, a whole separate topic. But structures become even more valuable if you if you make a real estate investment. Absolutely. But just to summarize, so there's two ways to avoid the issue of U.S. estate tax. So one would be to create invest through a company or or, or trust. Uh, the other one would be to live in a country uh, that has an estate tax treaty uh, with the United States, um, estate and gift tax treaty, ideally, and therefore get a higher exemption. Right. And then the last one, a third that one, would be. Uh, that we need to touch on would be th this idea that, okay, you can invest in the U.S. without investing in U.S. assets. So uh, you use the term CITES. Uh, I think it's a Latin legal term. It just means that the assets are deemed to be located in the U.S. for the purposes of um, estate, estate, tax. Yeah. estate and gift tax. Now, it is perfectly possible to invest through a U.S. account, but not hold assets that would be subject to U.S. estate tax, right? Correct. So obviously you need to work with someone who knows how to build such portfolios, but it's not particularly complicated. Uh, it does just require that you adjust your investment strategy a little bit. Um, so one way of doing so, for example, would be to hold a U.S. account and say you wanted to invest using exchange traded funds, you could build a portfolio of non US ETFs, right? Maybe exchange traded funds that are the brokerage that's capable of doing so, you so need, and trading yeah. on foreign exchanges, it, but yes, exactly. So maybe you know ETFs that are trading in London or you know registered in Luxembourg or Ireland, like many of the European ETFs are. So you could absolutely hold an account in the U.S. and enjoy all the benefits that we talked about before, um, but not actually hold assets that are uh, subject to U.S. estates. Right. Well, that's a and that's a broad solution, right? I yeah. mean, so you don't have to worry about treaty or whatever, although, you know. That pretty much solves yeah. all your problems right. as far as. You don't have to worry that if you move from one European country to another, that the treaty all of a goes sudden away. Mm -hmm. the treaty. What, what are some, is, um, yeah. so stocks, uh, publicly traded securities, Stan, are, are U.S. CITUS assets. Are there any, you know, cash, bonds, things like that, that yeah. we might I mean, think of that, as, that, as U.S. CITUS that aren't? That's a really good point. Um, um Publicly traded bonds are never U.S. CITES assets. So, um, and that's pretty amazing because it means U.S. Treasuries are not U.S. CITES. Right, and and when you th and when you think about that, when you think about that, there's always been a gigantic foreign demand mm -hmm. for U.S. Treasuries. Right, um, they're they're the safest in the world ostensibly. You know, um, at least before last January, we thought we had the most stable government in the world, and nothing could ever go wrong. But uh, but you know, I mean, we we we're the gold standard of of uh, of 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 publicly issued debt, right? It's it's full faith and credit. It's guaranteed. But there's also obviously in this in this world that we're starting to creep out of now this this zero interest you know bearing world. You know, the U.S. Treasuries, you know, throughout throughout this uh, period have yielded better than European or, or, or let's say Japanese or, or just basically name your, 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 your country that didn't have 10% inflation before inflation came to the rest of us, right? Well, just generally out yielding other um, developed countries um, debt. And one of the reasons why I think that we don't think about a lot, like the yield curve here has been very flat for a long time and there's parts of it that are, 
at least temporarily inverted and we cross our fingers and hope that that is temporary. But what I mean by that is that like your, your one year treasury uh, is trading below uh, is, is offering a better yield than your 10 year treasury. And then like, by the time you get out to the 30 year treasury, it's kind of, you know, almost on par with the, with the one year. Right. But, but, but pretty, you know, yields aren't, you know, what you would expect. You would expect if you're going to borrow for 30, if you were going to, borrow and not get paid back for 30 years that you get paid a better rate than mm. you would if you're only bar- lending the money for one year, right? Um, well, I, you know, I think a big part of that is the foreign demand, the foreign lust for right. for 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 U.S. fixed income Absolutely. because it's better yielding mm-hmm. and it's more liquid and it's potentially more stable, mm-hmm. right? We're the yeah, largest economy and, and, in the world. Yeah, and so, you know, one of the things you're looking at is this exchange trade in from currencies, you know, that have that they're worried about the value of their currency as well versus the US dollar into the US dollar cuz US dollar is still the global reserve currency, which Absolutely. I think yeah. up top, you know, one of the reasons as well people want to invest mm-hmm. in the US. But I think, you know, one of the things that we can look at here too is if you're an investor and you're, you know, outside of the United States, looking at how you structure your portfolio, again, maybe the U.S. and using U.S. bonds, mm-hmm. corporate as well, the, the 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 advantages of corporate disclosure that the U.S. has because they're publicly traded bonds, you know, that becomes another kind of reason for foreign investors to look to the United States because then that's the, the you know, the other way that you avoid some of these transfer tax worries. Um, right. So I think, you know, what we've identified here on the estate tax side, right, there are three ways to avoid it. Treaty, structuring, either via trust or, or offshore corporation, or buying non-U.S. CITES mm-hmm. products. That way you can avoid Actually, the, the estate The last tax. fourth loophole would be, of course, um, and, and, you know, we work with a, we work with a lot of, of non-resident aliens. Most of them tend to be people who are related to other clients, you know, the, the, the non U S spouse, if you will. Right. Um, but if, if, you, if you're such a person and you know, your, your spouse is American and your, your children are also American. So you may be, they, they all may hold two or more passports. Right. Um, anything that you gift or bequeath to, um, to those pe- to, to those people, um, I'm sorry to 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 your spouse anyway. At any rate, right? Anything you you bequeath to a U.S. spouse is completely 100 percent exempt. Even if you had two trillion dollars worth of U.S. CITES assets, as long as they go to that U.S. spouse, there is no gift or estate tax. Correct. So that's the fourth solution. That's that's, that's, that's a very limited American, subset. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, we talk <laughs> about these limited subsets about treaty, but we're talking about eighteen. You know, we're all the residents of like eighteen different countries. Right here, we're talking about a limited subset of people who are married to U.S. citizens, yeah. and that's Correct. the person that they would bequeath or gift to. Correct. Yep. Right? So you know, uh, that being the the fourth exemption, um, very quickly. You know, we're we're pushing up against time here. Um, income, income tax. taxes. Mm-hmm. Yes. What What are the income tax worries that uh, a well, first, non-citizen, non-resident would have the, investing in the U.S.? So non-resident aliens are 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 not subject to U.S. capital gains, and, and that may shock the general audience to hear. But like you know, I mean, when you think about your investments in a brokerage account, you think about you know your capital gains liability. Um, non-resident aliens don't pay capital gains tax. Uh, however on dividends and interest in a, a taxable brokerage account, they would be subject to withholding. And the default withholding for non-resident aliens is 30%, which sounds pretty high, right? Um, so, and that's, again, on U.S., for income tax purposes, U.S. CITES assets, which is a different class of CITES than for estate and gift tax purposes. So that's confusing. We don't have time to go through all of that, of course. But understand that the default withholding rate is 30%. And while we only have income tax, and that can be lowered by treaty, right? And whereas we only have a, a gift and estate tax treaty with about 18 different countries in the world, we have almost 100 different countries where the U.S. has an income tax treaty. And those tend to lower the withholding rates on interest in, and, and dividends significantly. 
sometimes down to 10%, even 5% in certain cases. Right. Absolutely. And when you say withholding, that's one question that people uh, might ask also is, you know, if I hold an account in the U.S., do I necessarily have to file a U.S. tax return at, at the end of the year? Right. And the the answer is no, not no. not necessarily, because withholding, what it is means tax. is it, the tax is actually withheld at source from uh, the dividends that you collect by the broker, right? So the way that that works in practice is when you go to open an account as a, as a uh, foreign national in the U.S., you will be asked to uh, disclose certain information about your uh, your tax situation, and you will be asked to sign a form, which is called W-8 Ben, which will just uh, attest that you are not subject to U.S. taxes, uh, which is great. But it also means that you will be withheld on U.S. income that you collect, and that will be right. done at source. That form, and that's the place where you can also make your treaty election. Exactly. So that form W-8 also gives you the ability to make a treaty claim right there and then, even as you open the account, so that the correct withholding rate that corresponds to your country of residence uh, will be applied at source. Now, one thing I'll, I'll note is while you know non-resident aliens uh, may not necessarily have capital gains taxes, under the treaty claim, they may have capital gains withheld then because of that because of that treaty certain countries will you know essentially require the u.s or under the terms of the tax treaty you'll end up with with withholdings and, well under the treaty you'll still owe taxes in your in your residence country uh, right? absolutely then it becomes a matter of just it's a case-by-case situation where you need to understand you know what what who owes what to what country effectively yep. um but again there's a solution to that problem as well Right. So you can avoid the U.S. withholding by simply not collecting U.S. source income. And so, you know, one of the solutions that we discussed when we talked about state tax exposure was the possibility of investing in non-U.S. Non -US assets. But now right? for income tax purposes, which would also include a very big universe of investments, which would be publicly traded bonds. Mm -hmm. So um, right. it's, it's another way around. Yep. So you can build a portfolio that is not subject to U.S. withholdings by, for example, buying exchange-traded funds that are and not U.S. funds. funds. That are registered abroad, mm -hmm. which Absolutely. may hold U.S. assets. Exactly. Or municipal, municipal bonds. Sure. Or yep. municipal bonds. So again, if you work with an advisor who has that expertise, it is possible to hold a portfolio that avoids exposure to both the U.S. estate tax and some of the U.S. withholding taxes as well. Yeah. So a lot of lot of stuff that we touched on today uh, covered, you know, taxes, investing, why uh, non-citizen, non-residents may want to invest in the United States. Some cases you may not even realize that you're facing these issues uh, because you, you know, work for a U.S. company and you've got stock options. Other cases where you may end up with U.S. investments and not realize that you lived in the U.S., worked for the U.S., uh, you know, and you have a, an IRA here and that, that presents. So a lot of things that we haven't touched on, you know, another thing that, uh, is important in all of this is if you're relocating to the U S from, mm. and that's another topic. So there's more, uh, we haven't touched on real estate, so there's more. So we'll probably develop this more. If you have questions about any of this or topics, if you're a non U S citizen, non U S resident interested in investing in the United States and you have more questions, Feel free to reach out to any of us, Sil, Stan, or I with those questions. Hopefully we can incorporate them into a, a, another edition of this kind of stream of the, of the podcast. And we thank you for listening. Walkner Cotton Financial Advisors is a registered investment advisor with the SEC. Registration with the SEC does not imply a certain level of skill or training. The opinions expressed by the participants of this podcast are their own and do not reflect the opinions of Walkner Cotton Financial Advisors. All statements and opinions expressed are based upon information considered reliable, although it should not be relied upon as such. Any statements or opinions are subject to change without notice. Information presented is for educational purposes only and does not intend to make an offer or solicitation for the sale or purchase of any specific securities, investments, 
or investment strategies. Investments involve risk and unless otherwise stated are not guaranteed. Information expressed does not take into account your specific situation or objectives and is not intended as recommendations appropriate for any individual. Listeners are encouraged to seek advice from a qualified tax, legal, or investment advisor to determine whether any information presented may be suitable for their specific situation. Past performance is not indicative of future performance. Thanks for listening, and for further information, please visit walknercondon.com.